This is the Helios 44-2, and if you know anything about optics, you'll know just how great this little lens is. But if you've ever tried to use it for filmmaking, you'll know just how problematic that can be. This is the Iron Glass Mark II, and it solves every problem the Helios has, and for the very first time, this lens can be used on professional sets at the highest level. A few years ago, I made a video with Alan Besedin from Vintage Lenses for Video, and we discussed how the project with the Ironglass first got started and what led to the Mark I rehousing. Since then, I bought a set of Mark I's myself and I've shot short films and even a feature with them. And whilst the images they produce are fantastic, the rehousing still had a few drawbacks compared to true cinema lenses. It was, of course, Iron Glass's first attempt at rehousing any lenses, so they can be forgiven for not getting things perfect the first time around, especially given their affordable price point. So, when Iron Glass announced the Mark II rehousing, I eagerly jumped in the queue, and then I waited. Rehousing any lens is always going to be a long process, and I waited nine months for my Mark I's from ordering to receiving the set. Since then, however, there's a little something you might have heard about going on in Ukraine which is impacting wait times. From placing the pre-order to receiving my lenses took 16 months and that includes 6 months in which the lenses were away when I sent the set back to Ukraine to be upgraded. Today I am very pleased to introduce you to the Iron Glass Soviet Set Mark II. The full set consists of a 20, 28, 37, 58, 85 and 135mm focal lengths. All of the lenses in this set cover full frame and beyond, but by just how much more was quite surprising. During my testing I discovered that the 20mm covers Alexa LF open gate, the 28mm covers Monstro 8K, the 37mm covers Alexa 65 at 5.1K, and the 58, 85 and 135 all cover Alexa 65 open gate, which is a whopping 60mm image circle. The 85mm in the Mark I set was a Jupiter 9, however for the Mark IIs, Iron Glass introduced the option to upgrade to a Helios 40-2 instead. The Jupiter 9, in my mind, was the weakest lens optically in the set. The Helios 40-2, on the other hand, matches its smaller sibling, the Helios 44-2, a lot closer. These lenses have been around since the 60s and 70s and so there is plenty of existing sample imagery, footage and photos out there showcasing their unique look. Therefore I'm going to dive right into discussing the rehousing itself and I'll include some sample footage of my own towards the end of the video. Now before we go any further, let's consider the price for a moment. Some people question why would I pay upwards of $2,500 for a $50 lens? Well, you're paying for the engineering and the mechanics, not the optics, and at around half the price of any other quality rehousing, these are actually extremely good value for money. So what do you get for your money, and how are they better than the base lens? And what are the improvements over the Mark Ones? Well, first of all, you get a professional lens mount. I've opted for the industry standard PL mount, however, EF is available. That said, Iron Glass do offer a PL to EF adapter that I purchased with the Mark Ones and I'm pleased to report work with all of the Mark IIs as well. It's worth noting that this was designed for these lenses specifically and so isn't compatible with most PL lenses as their mounts extend too far into the adapter. But having this option seems to me like the best of both worlds, getting the lenses in PL and being able to adapt them to virtually any other mount out there, whether that's Canon EF, RF, Sony E and so on. Unlike the Mark Ones, these lens mounts are user shimmable and the rear caps are not only low profile but flat too. The Mark Ones couldn't stand on the ends as they had a round cap. That brings me on to my first and probably only negative comment about these lenses and that is that the rear caps are quite difficult to remove, often requiring digging your nails around the edges to prise them from the lens. It's where the rubber gasket has a tight seal around the mount. Interestingly though, one of the lenses in this set it's perfectly easy to remove, so I suspect that they'll probably get easier over time through use. That said, I know that the feedback has already been passed on to the team, and by the time you're watching this, they've probably addressed and resolved the issue. The front caps too are really nice. I know they experimented with some bolder ideas and concepts, but I'm glad they went for this clean, more minimalist look in the end. They slip on and off the lens really satisfyingly with just the right amount of friction. 
You may have noticed how the lenses are now marked in T-stops instead of F-stops like on the Mark ones and the base optics. This is of course a standard feature across the industry and will no doubt be a welcome change for ACs, DPs and rental houses. Most of the original lenses only had 6 or 8 aperture blades, however they've all been replaced with an impressive 15 blade aperture for wonderful spherical bokeh. An odd number of aperture blades is something I appreciate in a lens because they produce wonderful sun starts when stopped down. That's the little pings of light you get off of highlights or if the sun is in frame. Each streak is produced where two aperture blades meet. An even number of blades will only produce as many points as it has blades, as the streaks align on opposite sides, whereas an odd number of blades will double the number of points. So a 15 blade aperture will produce a 30 point sun star. The exception to the aperture replacement is the 135mm lens, which uses the original iris because it already has a 20 blade aperture. Yes, it's an even number of blades, but then a 20 point sun star is already impressive and more than most lenses will produce. I don't actually know of any other lens with as many blades as this, but if you do, do let me know. Something else that ACs in particular will be pleased about is that the lenses now finally have reverse focus scales, meaning there are witness marks on the right hand side of the lens for focus pulling from. The lenses are available in both metric and imperial, however the norm in the UK, for lenses at least, is to still use units of the empire, so I have my set in feet and inches. The focus system itself is the biggest improvement over the Mark 1s and is one of the primary reasons why this rehousing is worth the cost over the original base lens. For Iron Glass's first foray into lens rehousings, the Mark 1s kept the helicoid from the original lens, and whilst this is an effective way of keeping complexity and therefore costs down, it did have a number of downsides. Unless you were using an ultra lightweight matte box like the Bright Tangerine Misfit Atom and perhaps a single filter, it was strongly advised not to use clip-on matte boxes at all because the added weight was hanging on that helicoid, it made the focusing stiffer and could even damage the helicoid threads. Therefore, if you wanted to use a matte box, really the only option was to mount one on rods, but this had its own problems. Because the lens was using the original helicoid, it physically extended during focusing. This made lens changes slow and fiddly, as it necessitated a donut in your matte box, and if you weren't careful, the lens could potentially hit the back of a filter. The Mark IIs feature an all-new internal focusing system that alleviates all of these issues. That means it remains the same physical length throughout its focusing range, and crucially, it means that you can now use clip-on matte boxes without any risk of damage. All of the lenses also feature industry standard 95mm fronts. Lens geeks among you may be asking, what focus system are Iron Glass using then? Well, most cine lenses use a cam-based system, which is what gives them their silky smooth feel. However, after heavy use, they can begin to wear. Helicoid systems, on the other hand, are arguably more reliable and despite what I just said about their drawbacks, it isn't unheard of for true cine lenses to utilize this system and maintain an internal focus mechanism. Just look at the Ari Zeiss Ultra Primes for a prime example. Iron Glass have developed their own unique system, which is a hybrid between both helicoid and cam. It employs the reliability of helicoid and the smoothness of cam. The focus ring isn't quite as weightless as something like a Master Prime, but it's much lighter than the Mark ones and is very easy to focus pull by hand right off the barrel. Focus rotation is 300 degrees across the set and both rings are now unified across every focal length, meaning that both the focus and iris rings are in the same position relative to the lens mount, from the diminutive, almost pancake-like 20 millimeters all the way up to the beefy 135. I encountered this problem myself on set using the Mark 1s. Anytime I wanted to use the 20 millimeter or the 135, I would need to reposition the lens motors on the rods. So I'm really pleased to see that this has been addressed. With regards to focus, the 37 millimeter deserves a special mention. The base lens is a mere 1V. It's possibly my favorite lens in the whole set and yet it has one huge flaw and that is its long close focus. My general rule of thumb for close focus is that it should be no more than 10 times the focal length for that lens to be useful. For example, I would expect a 50mm lens to have a close focus of 50cm or under. The Mir 1V has a close focus of 70cm, which makes it unusable for close-up shots that a medium wide focal length like this is so often used for. The Mark 1's improved on this by bringing the close focus down to 57cm, 
but I still found myself hitting that limit and wishing I could get closer. Therefore, I am so happy to see that the Mark IIs have improved on this again and brought the close focus all the way down to 36 centimeters, or about 10 times that focal length as desired. One final word about focus to take note of is that whilst they now have an internal focus system and the physical barrels don't extend, the glass elements within still do. Now, that's okay for most of the focal lengths, however, do be aware that the 28 and the 20 millimeter lenses, when set to close focus, their glass elements do extend beyond the rim of the lens. So if you're gonna be putting the lenses face down without a cap, which is usually okay, make sure to set them away from close or ideally at infinity before doing so. To demonstrate how the lenses perform, I thought it would be appropriate to come to a vintage country fair. I'm shooting in full frame and other than a Rec 709 LUT, no color correction has been applied and everything was shot wide open. All being from the same Mir family of lenses, the 20, 28 and 37 mm share similar flare characteristics. These are most extreme on the 37mm and they are very easy to induce even when the light source is off axis and well out of frame. The Helios 40-2 is a big improvement over the Jupiter 9 and the fast aperture really makes images pop. The 20mm has very little barrel distortion typical of wide angles, however it does have a slight natural vignette that actually I find quite appealing. By swapping out the Jupiter 9, the 135 is now probably the weakest lens in the set, but it's still perfectly acceptable and certainly comes in handy when you need something a little longer and perhaps not as intense as the new 85. Sharpness and contrast are both reasonable and swirly bokeh is still evident though it's much tamer than the two Helios lenses. The Helios 44-2 is a sharp and punchy lens, though as soon as it flares, everything goes milky white, which I absolutely love. The lens exhibits essentially no chromatic aberration, just a nice halation that makes the image bloom and glow. The 85 is really only sharp in the middle, with dramatic fall off away from centre. This makes it great for portraits, but difficult to get multiple subjects in a row all in focus. I suspect the focus plane has a slight curvature to it, and bizarrely I noticed during testing on the projector that the sharpness improves again beyond full frame into Alexa 65 territory. Out of focus areas are very low contrast, making the depth of field appear shallower than it actually is and compared to other lenses of the same focal length and speed. The 28 complements the other wide angles in the set with less vignetting than the 20mm and compared to the 37, a slightly easier to control but no less dramatic flare.
The 37 still exhibits some swirly bokeh, and this is even more noticeable at the new much improved close focus shown here. Everything the Helios 44-2 is famous for, the 40-2 cranks it up to 11. Low contrast, swirly bokeh and absolutely wild flares. It really is the 58mm on steroids and is an excellent addition to the set. With many manufacturers making new lenses in spicy varieties such as the Zeiss Supreme Radiance, Canon Sumire and Sigma Classics just to name a few, not to mention the skyrocketing price of vintage lenses like K35s, it's clear that the industry's appetite for funky lenses is here to stay. The quality of this rehousing is easily on par with anything produced by the other high-end rehousing companies. For me, that's what makes the Soviet set particularly exciting. Not only are they far more affordable than any of the lenses I just mentioned, but it's a set of authentic vintage lenses that produce wonderful images and now for the very first time, thanks to this rehousing, they fulfill every professional requirement and I cannot wait to see what people create with them.